Good morning. Good morning, Amir. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. So you joined Accor in 2015 at a time when the company was moving in lots of different strategic directions. Um, could you please tell us a bit about what you brought to the table in terms of F&B? Sure. Uh, first, I thought I'd uh, summarize a couple of my key takeaways from the previous speakers. I think takeaway number one is expats suck. <laughs> takeaway number two, it's all about textures. And then takeaway number three, blue cocktails are, are in our future. <laughs> um, but listen, in, in, in all seriousness, let me give you a little bit of context um, uh, about a core. I think about three years ago, uh, when Sebastian uh, Bazin became CEO, uh, he embarked on a very audacious transformation. <clears throat> and there, there's many ways that you can interpret that uh, transformation, but it essentially came down to two things. Uh, number one, really following our guests. So this is uh, things that we've done with Mama Shelter with 25 hours recently because you've got uh, more of our guests choosing that type of hotel, that kind of offering around lifestyle, um, uh, bolstering our luxury portfolio, becoming more international. And then number two is, is really becoming world class in everything that we did. Um, and we were world class, we are world class. Uh, in, in the economy segment, in the mid-scale segment, and then in some places we had great luxury properties, but that was one of the areas that we needed to bolster, and so we did with FRHI um, and you know, small investment in, in Banyan Tree recently. And so that's the broader context, and F&B very much fell into that, where F&B is a huge part of our revenue. Accor Hotels today uh, has over 5 billion euros in food and beverage uh, revenues, and we weren't satisfied um, with our performance and what we were offering uh, to our guests. So uh, that's, that's how I came in. And since then, really our focus has been on following the guests and making uh, that experience a lot better uh, for the communities that we're in and, and people who come from out of town. So that's a little bit of context on, on what we've been doing. OK. And what's your take on um, F&B trends at the moment? Yeah, so I think on, on trends, um, it's really important uh, f for us at least to distinguish between cyclical trends and secular trends. And I feel like a lot of what we talked about this morning fall into the category of cyclical trends. You know, we say, well, textures are in and, and purple plates are, are really cool and blue cocktails. And, and that is actually really important. Those are important hooks and things that we should follow. Um, the, the challenge with that is if that's all you're looking at, and, and as hoteliers, as folks in hotels, there is a tendency to overly focus on those. You kind of lose sight on the more secular ones and, and what matters most. And, and so one of the things that I've done uh, that we've spent a lot of time doing at Accor is trying to get our teams to, first of all, align on what are those secular trends that matter most, and then focus on really those trends. And so we've boiled this landscape down to, to eight things that I'll share with you. So I'll give you a little bit of our, of our secrets. And a lot of this we've touched on today. Um, but the first set of, of, of trends that we think are really important, and, and these are not things that'll change in three months. In 2017, we think as we look at the next five to 10 years, these eight things is what will influence our business more than anything in food and beverage. So interested. This is hugely important. Over the past five years, doesn't matter where you are, here, New York, London, Saudi, everyone is interested in food and beverage, right? You've got top chef, master chef. You talk to chefs and they're like, wow, I would have never thought that anyone gives a shit about what I do. And, and so this is really cool. Social, right? We talked about Instagram posts, fake Facebook posts. This is a huge deal. You used to go, take France as an example, and we've got the gentleman from Michelin here. You'd go to a Michelin star restaurant, you'd take your camera out and take a picture. Oh, no, no, pas de photo, s'il vous plaît. Now it's totally different, right? The chef will come and pose. Clever restaurants will have plates that are adapted to Instagram, and this is a big deal, right? It has a huge impact 
on how we market, right? And how we should market over the next five to 10 years, right? Our marketing budgets should look fundamentally different. And so, secular trend, informed. It used to be, you fly from Paris to Bangkok, what do you have? You got a guidebook, right? 10 years ago, you got a guidebook. At best, the information in that guidebook is 12 months old, really at best. Today, it doesn't matter where you go, and I, I should have put the Zomato logo there as well, but it doesn't matter where you go. You've got really good uh, information, data that's up to date, accurate, and, and you know what, even individual bloggers, people have figured out a way of whether they like that person or not. And it's their choice, they like that person's taste. And so people are way more informed than before. It all, the implication of that is, we just can't be bad, ever. Because before, it would take a while until people found out. If you were a restaurant, you could rest on your laurels. Because you know what, it took two years until people found out. Today, that's not the case. I'm bad for a week, people will know. You know, the, the last thing I, uh, on the top right is this awesome is everywhere. And, and we, we touched on some of these today, but it is amazing the number of really cool concepts that you have uh, in, in the mid-scale, if you want to call it casual dining. I've just put two in here that, to me, uh, around the corner from Paris are really cool. That's Byron Burgers and Chicken Shop. Um, and that is really redefining how good we all have to be. Um, healthful is an overall category that encompasses everything from, I gotta know where the ingredients are from, you know, is the meat pasture raised, does it have antibiotics, you know, do you have gluten-free offerings? I think this is an important trend today and it'll stay around. This notion of hurried, um, you've got a French example here which in 2000, the average length of time uh, for lunch was 90 minutes. Today, it's 30 minutes or less. Um, and and that's, that's a big deal as we all think about what kind of, of offering we want to give to our guests, which also links a little bit to the next one, which is less, and, less is more. Um, and I think it used to be that in food and beverage, the canon of excellence, the canon of beauty, of luxury, was defined by very traditional French, you know, call it three-star Michelin, dining, and that's just not the case today. It doesn't matter what the price point is, less is more. It doesn't mean cheap. The examples that I've put on this page are deliberately really expensive. You know, Noma, Mastro's, those are expensive outlets, but they're outlets with much less frills. It's about putting the ingredient forward. You might be in a place with you no know, tablecloth, you'll have an incredibly knowledgeable, passionate waiter or waitress, but they might be completely tatted up and have a very different service approach. And that is, is what we find people are looking for more and more. And then the last one around convenience, and, and we touched on this today, and, and this and Awesome Everywhere are probably the two new additions to this list. So if we had spoken a year ago, you would have seen everything on this page except for maybe those two, because those are really taking hold in enough places today that I think it's starting to have a big impact on our business. And I, I almost view it as um, it's a little bit of every place is becoming like New York. If you've ever lived in New York, you've always had delivery 24-7. You want to have Korean food at 3 a.m., no problem. And that's now coming to places like Paris, Dubai, everywhere around the world. And you know what? If you look at New York, it's an amazing des uh, dining destination. So I, I don't view this as a threat. I view this as a big opportunity for the hotel space, for the restaurant space. It just means we need to raise our game. So again, one of the big things we've done is to say, okay guys, hold on. Cyclical things matter, but we gotta focus on the secular trends. These are not actually gonna change this year. In two months, we don't foresee a lot of addition or changes to this. And so let's kind of have confidence in, in this view of the world, to spend a lot of time uh, aligning and getting people to understand this joint diagnostic. So anyway, okay. long-winded <laughs> answer to your question. Um, so how has the car responded to this view of food and beverage today then? Yeah, so I think from this, what we, what we try to say is, all right, so 
what do you do, right? Because if not, you start to say, oh my God, this year it's all about, you know, do it yourself, and then next year it's got to be burgers, but oh my God, burgers are going to die in a year, so I got to go to pizza. And so again, if this is the reality, um, we try to say, listen, so let's do four things. The first one, and this might seem, you know, overly simple, but it's all about we got to deliver excellence with simplicity and authenticity. And let's kind of, you know, it's the old uh, American adage, it's the product stupid. And, and it's true. We, we got to do something that is just excellent. All the successful concepts that we talked about today are excellent. If you go to Vapiano, everything works. The food's good. The, and so that's what we try to say is don't spend too much time on worrying about what's hot right now because our objective is not to be just hot and trendy. We seek to be essential. We want to be an essential part of the fabric of the community that we're in for the local people around our hotel. And for us to do that, we have to be excellent. And excellence is about what's on your plate. It's about the lighting. It's about the music. It's about the service that you get. It's not or. It is all of those things. Um, for us today, excellence has a huge part of simplicity, right? People want things that are way simpler, but simplicity is also a way to get excellence. The second you have anything that's complex in the hotel F&B world, or frankly, in the F&B world, you are dead on arrival, right? F&B business is complicated. Ah, your ingredients might not get there. Things that you got might actually be a little bit different. If you're doing pastry, the humidity's height makes a difference. Well, half your staff didn't show up. A big party came in that you weren't expecting. You got to be simple. Number two is um, really thinking about uh, F&B as a source of entertainment and as a hub. I think there was another word used this morning around being the centerpiece of co-working, et cetera. That's true. Um, and, and people for the foreseeable future are going to want experiences that are fun and exciting uh, and, and authentic. So that's kind of pillar number two is everything we do should have a measure of entertainment. It could be as simple as an open kitchen. It could be simple, as simple as a service routine where a chef or a cook comes out and puts a little bit of sauce from a pot. Uh, just small things like that that animate a place. Number three is listening to and serving our guests. Um, today, there is a wealth of information uh, that's out there. Um, all of our F&B directors, chefs, et cetera, can have access to an application where they've got summaries daily of everything that um, the, the social web is saying about them. And so this is about encouraging all of our teams to create routines to digest that information, as painful as it might be sometimes, and then flow it back into the menus. And, and that has two, it requires two things. Number one, we need to make it okay for people to experiment. Sometimes when I talk to our chefs in our hotels about changing a menu, it's almost like we're gonna release radioactive, you know, it's okay guys, if the menu doesn't work, you know, we'll go back. Right? We're, we're not dealing with nuclear power plants, and so we have to make it okay to try new things. And then the second part is realize that, hey, not everything requires a seven-year CapEx cycles. In fact, if you look at what guests comment the most about, it has nothing to do with CapEx. Yeah, if you've got a really shitty environment, sure, but most of the things that they care about are, are fixable without CapEx. And then last one is about inspiring and motivating our people. As, as Olivier said this morning, we've got close to 10,000 uh, restaurants worldwide, restaurants and bars, 5 billion euros in revenues, and yet everyone knows us as a hotel group. And we want to be known as a food and beverage group. And so this has a big dimension of being more present on big F&B campuses, being seen, as, as a restaurateur. And then lastly, it's also spending time with our chefs and F&B directors so they understand that a big part of what they need to do is 
uh, train their teams, coach their teams, and spend time with their teams. So anyway, now you know all of a core secret. <laughs> Is there any particular management model that you think works best for achieving your objectives? By management model, you mean... So in-house, franchising, leasing? Yeah, it's, to be honest with you, not really. Um, I think that um, um, every management model can be successful, and there is a right uh, place and team for different models. At, at Accor Hotels, we've got lots of su successful third parties. You know, in uh, Paris, for example, at the Wild Monceau, we've got a great Matsuhisa that we were very happy with uh, around the corner from there. We've got Les Cocottes by Christian Constant. Um, and, and so w we believe that um, those can be successful. However, they are absolutely not the right model for every place, and they are not the solution uh, to you know, solving the issues that, that we face. So we look at each case individually, and we look for uh, the right partner. Um, what does the right partner mean? I think, uh, number one, it's a, it's a partner that really does have recognition, and so today, um, we look for, for, for brands that can bring people in, uh, number one. Number two, you got to have an individual who, spent, who is willing to spend time in that place. If all you're getting is a brand but that chef or, or whoever is key to that concept will not spend time in that location, it won't be successful. Um, we look for concepts, brands, chefs that, that are pretty baked. What I mean by that is, it's like any franchise, right? You want them to have their routines down um, so that they can plug and play. Sometimes you kind of feel that they're learning along with you and that's not as helpful. And then lastly, economic terms that work with everyone because I think traditionally you've had a lot of these third parties where the only person who made money is the celeb chef or the third party and, and that's not sustainable for anyone in the long term. So if we do go uh, with a third party, those are the things that we look for. But again, um, it, it's, it, it's something that we look for in some places. It's not the right answer every place. Okay. Have you learned any important lessons from FRHI? Uh, absolutely. You know, in terms of lessons, though, it's not like I can point to, oh my god, they had a secret that we didn't mm. know. Um, it's more about, um, I think FRHI had a great culture uh, around food and beverage, and, and food and beverage was perhaps naturally a little bit more prominent for FRHI, so um, the, the GMs, the, the regional VPs, all of those guys had a bigger appreciation for the importance of food and beverage, and they brought that to us. Number two, I think uh, they, had, they have some great outlets. Um, you know, if I think about Los Angeles, for example, um, tough market, really cool places, uh, et cetera, um, Bungalow has been one of the top bars in Santa Monica, generating north of $10 million of revenue consistently for, my gosh, I don't know, seven years now. And that was a former conference room. And so being able to have that in your portfolio as an example to use has been great. And then lastly, I'd say uh, just an awesome set of, of people. So more than lessons, it's the, the great teams that have joined Accor from FRHI and, and hopefully can raise all of our, our teams and, and properties up. Okay. What would you like people to say about Accor in five years' time? Um, in terms of F and B, I guess, so I'd focus on, on three constituencies. I think number one would be, would be guests. And, and again, it's very important when I talk about guests, I actually focus primarily on the local community. So I think for hotels, we need to think about our immediate local community, and that's our target market. If we make them happy, international guests will, will be happy. So number one would be for those populations to recognize, wow, you guys have really cool F&B. You have become essential 
to the fabric of my community. When I think about going out, I choose to go to places that, that happen to be in a core hotel. So that would be number one. Number two is around our, uh, our teams. And I think um, th them saying, gosh, we've seen that we are turning into more of an F&B company, and, and it's a great, of course, a great place to have a career, not just on the hotel track, but also in F&B. And then lastly would be our, our investors, uh, just seeing a higher return on their square footage uh, in food and beverage, and, and viewing us as a, as a great partner to them in food and beverage like we are on the hotel side. I think we're going to have to wrap up, but we'll have one time for one or two questions. Okay. One very quickly from me. I absolutely buy into, if you're running a soft hotel in a great resort town, or a no hotel in the centre of a city, I get the whole food and beverage piece. It's interesting that 10 miles away from where I live is a town in the UK called Milton Keynes. There's not a lot going on in Milton Keynes, although it's one of the biggest growing cities, seemingly. Uh, but... Say the Novotel there, and you've got 10 restaurants within five minutes' walk. I, I wonder, uh, and it would be interesting to get your take, is, is there a, do you think there's a future where some of your properties won't have food and beverage propositions at all? I mean, it depends. But let, so uh, for me, saying we can only have cool uh, restaurants or bars in a Sofitel, or in an, I think that's just plain wrong. Um, uh, for me, it depends on the location, and I, I, I don't, I mean, I always say this in, in a core, I don't think only rich people should get the privilege of eating well or drinking well, and a lot of what we've done has actually been in Ibis and Novotel, and it comes back to that simplicity and authenticity and, and excellence, so with a short menu, with a really cool space, um, and value for money, which, by the way, is just as important in luxury, you can have a great place. And, and some of the things that I guess I'm most proud of over the past 18 months has happened in Ibis and Novotel. So I'd encourage you to check out what we've done at Ibis Cambridge, uh, Novotel Canary Wharf. And just don't even go further than Dubai. The restaurant and bar that we have in the Ibis, we have an awesome new... Uh, Cuban bar in Dubai at an Ibis called Cubalito. Um, and we've got a great kind of Chinese walk experience right next to it in the Ibis as well that attracts a lot of people from the outside. So for me, again, we need to stop thinking about this as it's part of the hotel. If the space and location warrants it, then it should be a kick-ass place that just happens to be in a hotel. And so, yes, are there some places where tomorrow I could choose to have very light restaurants or no restaurants? Sure, but that's not because the label on the hotel. It's because that location doesn't warrant uh, a, a restaurant. Thank you very much. And I'm, we're literally going to go, we'll go for the gentleman over the back here for one last question. Oh, someone's running. Hi. Um, well-known factor in the hotel industry is that consistency, which you didn't put into your uh, pillars in that respect, uh, that every time you get a new GM or the wife or the F&B or the chef, you change menus, you change concept, you change tabletops whatsoever. How are you dealing with keeping the consistency when you make, make great new concepts now in all the properties you mentioned here and ensuring that in two years, three years, whatever, whenever you change the key staff in that respect, how would you ensure that the concept stays as it's supposed to be? Yeah, so two things. One, consistency is part of excellence. If you're not consistent, you're not excellent. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, so how, how, how do you do that? Number one, consistency while you have the same GM is important, right? So I distinguish between, between the two. I think how you do that is by actually saying that this is an important measure. And, and I think that's actually, pretty, for us to a certain extent, can be pretty revolutionary. Telling people, I don't need you to be different at all costs. I don't need you to worry about the blue cocktail. 
but I need you to worry about making a great Bloody Mary and being consistent every day. And that's what's going to bring guests back in, because that's what matters. GMs will actually, GMs and F&B directors will actually change their behavior, right? They will start to think more about, about the importance of consistency versus some of the other things. So that's number one. Number two, how do you deal with it with GMs changing all of that? I think you, you change it by having uh, an F&B team that can be a little bit of a custodian and a support so that when GMs leave, you don't have all the good ideas from the previous GM leaving with them, and you can kind of get that consistency. But conversely, whether a GM is here or not, they can also get support from FNB professionals who will help them uh, get the right concept. So it, there's a governance aspect to what, you, what you're saying, and, and, and we address that by having uh, and if F and B team who partners up with the properties. Crystal, Amir, thank you so very much. And I presume you'll both be around at lunchtime, so yeah. you're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Big round of applause. Thank you.